Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. I've spent the past week diving into the subject of trying to identify whose face is on the Great Sphinx, and this two part special will hopefully bring us closer in solving the riddle. Whether or not the Sphinx was originally a lion, a jackal, a mound with a hawk's head, or simply a piece of weathered natural limestone, we'll probably never know for sure, but most agree that the head of the Sphinx was recarved at some point in history by a dynastic pharaoh. But whose face are we actually looking at? In the past I've speculated it was Thutmose IV of the 18th dynasty, the man behind the dream stealer, the Sake king Amasis II who may have been buried in a cavity in its back, the water god Happy, or the ancient goddess Neith. The official interpretation is that the Sphinx shows the face of Khafre, the 4th dynasty king and supposed builder of the second pyramid on the Giza plateau, whilst others say it is Khufu, the supposed builder of the great pyramid, but there is no evidence to back this up. In truth, throughout its history, it could have been one or more pharaohs, because there is a huge amount of physical evidence that shows that statues of former pharaohs were reused by later kings. In some cases, stonemasons simply chiselled the cheekbones of old pharaonic statues so it looked a little more like the king of the day. Then, the old hieroglyphs were sanded away, and new hieroglyphs were engraved on top. This was an efficient way to venerate a new king. But what we're talking about in this video isn't just a mere statue of a pharaoh. This is the Great Sphinx, and it is therefore unlikely to have been modified and chiselled away by order of subsequent kings. The Sphinx isn't just a statue. It had its own personal name in the New Kingdom, and was worshipped as a representation of the great god Ra Horus, also known as Heracti. The face of the Great Sphinx is one of the most difficult subjects to research with regards to ancient Egypt, and it will ultimately end in my own opinion based on what I've read and observed. The research has to be so much more than comparing it to known statues of pharaohs, and has to take into account many specific details, and in this two part special I hope to give the most logical explanation based on evidence. So where shall I start? I'll begin with Thutmose IV, a strong candidate for the identity of the Sphinx, simply because of the Dream Stealer, which says that he cleared away the sands from around the monument to return it to its former splendour. We know that he built a mud brick wall to surround it, and to stop the encroaching sands, as his cartouches were found on this wall in excavations from the 1930s. He was also possibly responsible for a great deal of restoration work on the actual monument, and therefore maybe he did recarve the head as part of his renovations. It did seem to make sense to me, and this has been my thinking for the past 12 months. Chuck on the CF App 7865 channel has made some great videos on this hypothesis. He compared the profile of the head of the king's mummy to the profile of the Sphinx, and found a strong correlation. On top of this research, you also have the Dream Stealer itself, which shows the lion-esque sphinx body with the head of a pharaoh. All indications point to Thutmose IV, but there is a big problem. The sphinx had long been venerated in the 18th dynasty, way before Thutmose IV came to power. As I've discussed in many previous videos, the sphinx played a central religious role for the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty and was known by both its personal name, Horomachet, which means Horus in the Horizon, and as the god it represented, Herakti. Smaller Sphinx statues with a lion-esque form and pharaonic head were made, clearly mimicking the Great Sphinx, and were offered to it way before Thutmose IV, and this same representation was carved onto countless stele. Although new pharaohs did deface statues of previous kings, it is unlikely that Thutmose IV would deface the pharaonic head of the Great Sphinx, as it was the most important and iconic monument of the 18th dynasty, central to the religion of his immediate ancestors. To them, this wasn't the face of a king, but the face of the god Herakti. The dream stealer of Thutmose IV was erected between the paws of the Sphinx, but Thutmose IV wasn't the first 18th dynasty king to take a strong interest in the Sphinx and the Giza Plateau. He wasn't even the first king to erect a stealer in its vicinity. As we know, his father was Amenhotep II, and he built a Sphinx temple to the northeast of the monument. Inside his temple were found a number of stela showing sphinxes, lions with pharaonic heads, which means it is safe to assume that the sphinx already had its iconic form in the reign of Amenhotep II. 
So, with that in mind, could Amenhotep II be responsible for recarving the head of the Sphinx? Again, the logical answer is no, because although he did build a new Sphinx temple in the 18th dynasty, there is evidence to show that the Sphinx, aka Horamakhet, was prominent a long time before Amenhotep II came to power. In all of ancient Egyptian history, there is no specific clear written record of the Great Sphinx until the 18th dynasty, and it comes early on, in the fourth year of the reign of Thutmose I, the great-great-grandfather of Amenhotep II. It is the first direct reference to the Sphinx on a monument found relatively close by, and it was written by Prince Amenmos, son of Thutmose I. The inscription refers to the Sphinx as Horomachet, which was Hormachus to the Greeks, and it specifically says, Year 4 under the majesty of Thutmose I, beloved of Horomachet, given life like Ra forever. Furthermore, Amenhotep II also wasn't the first pharaoh to build a Sphinx temple in the 18th dynasty, because, as excavations have shown, there are foundations of an even older Sphinx temple below that of Amenhotep II, which some believe is the work of Thutmose I. For a while, I believe that Thutmose I, being a mighty, powerful and successful king, a man who also undertook building work at Giza, as shown in his Abydos Stela, may have been the pharaoh who placed his likeness on the Sphinx. But yet again, it is highly unlikely, and there is reason to believe the recarved head of the Sphinx goes back even further. Although under the reign of Thutmose I, the third king of the 18th dynasty, we do find the first written account of Horamachet, we actually find smaller Sphinx statues with the body of a lion and the head of a king in the reigns of the first and second kings of the 18th dynasty, namely Armos I and Amenhotep I respectively. Armos was the first king of the new kingdom of Egyptian history, a man who overthrew and banished the Hyksos, and it seems the Sphinx being elevated in status and referred to as Horamachet started at the very beginning of this new era of history, but possibly even slightly before. So, could the face of the Sphinx be that of Armos I, the hero and leader of the new kingdom of Egypt? In truth, it is highly unlikely that the face of the Sphinx is anybody from the new kingdom, and to understand why, we need to understand some fundamental details regarding the name of the Sphinx. As mentioned side by side with the name Horamachet, the Sphinx was also called Herakti, which means Horus the dweller in the horizon. Some stele from the 18th dynasty found around the Sphinx refer to it only as Herakti. Others Herakti and Horamachet, while some are just Horamachet. Both names essentially mean the same thing, but the origins of Herakti go back much further in history, and this does have big implications for the origins of the current form of the Sphinx. As noted by eminent Egyptologist Selim Hassan, in the New Kingdom, the god Herakti was depicted in a number of different forms. A sphinx with the head of a hawk, a sphinx with a human head, as a hawk-headed man, or as a simple hawk. All of these representations can be found on stele from the 18th dynasty found around the sphinx. In early Egyptian history, the hawk was the symbol of the great god of the Western Delta Kingdom, whose two eyes were the sun and the moon. As the Delta Kings extended their rule, they made Heliopolis their capital, and as the priests of that city already worshipped the solar disk, they mingled the two religions for political reasons, and the outcome was a sun god with the head of a hawk and crowned with a solar disk. His name was Ra Horus or Herakti. In Old Kingdom times, the pharaoh was an earthly representation of this god, and there is written proof in the pyramid texts that the Egyptians referred to the dead king as Herakti. It is the oldest mention of the dead king, written as Herakti, sailing to the western horizon of heaven. So, in Old Kingdom times, the king was viewed as a representation of God on earth. When he died, he was Herakti. It also shows that the Sphinx was a monument associated with death since Old Kingdom times, meaning it was well placed on the Giza necropolis. But in the New Kingdom, Pharaoh was no longer viewed as the great god, but was referred to as the son of God, and on death he was no longer referred to as Herakti. The name Herakti lived on, but instead of representing the god and the Pharaoh, it was now just a name for the god, the father. The Pharaoh was viewed as the son, the son of Herakti. This is shown most blatantly when Akhenaten established his monotheistic religion. Herakti became the one and only true god, a god whose full title was 
Ra Harakti, who rejoices in the horizon in his name of the light which is the sun disk. Akhenaten declared himself the son of the one god and was the only intermediary between the god and the people. But this concept wasn't the brainchild of Akhenaten, it was adopted by all of the 18th dynasty kings and beyond. For example, on the limestone doorposts of the 18th dynasty Sphinx temple, built by Amenhotep II, it says he made it as a monument for his father, Harakti. So, how does this all relate back to the Sphinx? Well, the Sphinx, which had a personal name of Horamakhet, was the statue of the sun god Harakti. In Old Kingdom times, a pharaoh could chisel his own face on the monument as he was Harakti. It wasn't blasphemous, but this couldn't have happened in the New Kingdom. The monument was a representation of the god, so an 18th dynasty pharaoh carving his own face onto the Sphinx would be him saying he was an incarnation of the sun god, when in fact the New Kingdom kings referred to themselves as sons of the sun god. Yes, each of the 18th dynasty kings did build their own smaller Sphinx statues, incorporating their likeness, but these statues were never referred to as representations of Harakti or Horamakhet. These were representations of the pharaoh as the son of the sun god. They were more like a homage. The names Harakti and Horamakhet were reserved solely for the great Sphinx. The Sphinx was on the Giza Plateau, with its lion-esque form and human pharaonic head at the beginning of and before the 18th dynasty, and I would guess it had been known as Horamakhet and Harakti for quite some time. In previous videos I have stated that I believe the Sphinx was turned into a lion in the 18th dynasty, but with all this information, it must have happened far earlier. The New Kingdom kings did renovate it, we know that, but they didn't construct it from an old mound of weathered limestone. Nobody knows the age of the Sphinx in its current form of a lion-esque body and pharaonic head. There are no contemporary inscriptions. There is also no inscription from the 18th dynasty that sheds any light on the monument's creator. It seems they're as much in the dark as we are. They were more concerned with identifying the Sphinx with the Ra Horus sun gods than establishing its origin. But can they give us any further information? On the Great Limestone Stealer of Amenhotep II, he refers to the Pyramids of Horamakhet, which may imply that he believed the Sphinx predated the Pyramids, an opinion shared by many modern independent researchers. The same pharaoh referred to it as both Horamakhet and Harakti, the latter god being mentioned in the Pyramid texts as being one of the oldest gods. On the Dream Stealer of Tutmose IV, he associates the Sphinx with the Old Kingdom sun gods Kepri, Ra and Artum, as well as Horamakhet. And so, like his father, Tutmose IV seems to believe that the Sphinx was a representation of the sun god. The last mutilated line of the Dream Stealer may refer to Khafre building the statue, but only the word Kaf is legible, not Khafre. Even if he was referring to Khafre, this was probably just guesswork at best, as nowhere else do any New Kingdom kings associate the Sphinx with Khafre. But as mentioned, Kepri, Artum and Ra are all Old Kingdom sun gods mentioned in the pyramid texts, but Harakti is older than all of them. Therefore, while the names associated with it in the 18th dynasty, we can assume that they believed that the Sphinx was the oldest god in Egypt. The face of the Sphinx must have been carved way before the New Kingdom. So, to end part 1 of this two part special, the Sphinx was already in the form of a lion with a human head in the 18th dynasty, and the kings of this dynasty associated the Sphinx with one of the oldest sun gods in Egyptian history, Harakti. They believed that this monument was truly ancient in its current form, and therefore the face of the Great Sphinx must be an Old Kingdom or Middle Kingdom Pharaoh, a king who himself believed would become Harakti on his death. But looking at the Sphinx, the head is smaller and out of proportion. It was certainly recarved, and maybe the 18th Dynasty kings did leave us one clue about what the head once was. As stated earlier, Harakti was portrayed as a recumbent lion with a hawk's head and this representation is seen in statues from the 18th and 19th dynasties and is also etched onto numerous stele found around the Sphinx and shown here. All of this does tie in with my hypothesis that originally the Sphinx may have been a representation of Sokar's mound with the Sokar hawk's head on top. I believe that at some point in the Old Kingdom or Middle Kingdom, somebody transformed this old weathered monument into Harakti, with their own face, which was also the face of Harakti, replacing the old weathered hawk's head. 
and the history of this event may have percolated down to the 18th dynasty, as shown by these representations. So, who transformed the monument? Whose face are we looking at? I'll give you my own point of view in the next part. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.